everyone. Thanks for coming for the talk, and especially Elias for the ending. You can think of this talk, this talk as starting from where he left. So this is joint work with my lab mix, Jage, Ashkan, and uh, Alon. <laughs> uh, imagine an Oxford comma in between, so that will clear it. <laughs> okay. So before I go to my talk, let's recap uh, some of the talks which were in similar in spirit for this talk. Um, so there were a lot of talks on discrete distributions. For example, yesterday, Sugip talked about estimating F divergences. Um, Jian Tao talked about estimating entropy. Yihan talked about estimating the support. Uh, yesterday, I mean, two days back, Jay gave, and today, uh, Greg talked about testing about these distributions. And there are some more to come tomorrow. Um, the focus of all these talks was to get near sample optimal estimators for the problems which we are studying. For example, I think many of them were able to solve this problem up to constants. So we know the sample complexity of most of these up to constants now. I think a natural question which many of you talk and some of you asked, including Professor Weisman, was what, happened to, what happens if we move from discrete to continuous? And if we move from, let's say, one dimension to high dimensions? Uh, Elias talked about continuous. And in this talk, we are going to see how dimensionality affects all this, um, even the basic problems such as just estimation. OK? OK, let me ask you a very simple question. What's the most important distribution? The Uber. Uh, huh? The Uber. <laughs> Uber distribution, yes. Some people prefer, you know, Lyft, Kangagas, but yeah. Anyway, OK? We all know it's a Gaussian. <laughs> OK. So let's see. Let's just uh, familiarize ourselves with some notation. I'm going to use mu to denote the mean, sigma to denote the standard deviation, and d to denote the number of dimensions. And uh, as some of you might have noticed, I'm going to use the covariance matrix of the form sigma squared times an identity. Uh, this is mostly because we tried analyzing it in a most general setting, and finally we figured out uh, even this basic problem is not well understood. So what's learning? What's learning a Gaussian? We get samples from it, and we just want to estimate the mean and the variance. Uh, let's be slightly more specific. We want to estimate the mean to some accuracy and the standard deviation to some accuracy. And I'm multiplying epsilon with some standard deviation to get like a standard answer. And uh, all the results in this talk will be with high probability. And I'm now going to discuss how error, how error probability epsilon, uh, delta will affect the sample bounds. Okay. And I'll ask the same question, which everyone else asked in the previous talks. Uh, how many samples we need? Are there efficient algorithms? Okay. This is fairly straightforward. It's just like if you just take a pen and paper, work it out, you'll figure out the number of samples you need is d by epsilon square, where d is the number of dimensions, and epsilon is the accuracy you want. Okay. So, and it's also information theoretically optimal. And what's the efficient algorithm? It's just you find the empirical mean, empirical variance, and you're done. Okay. So let's go to the next most important distribution. And uh, any guesses what that might be? Mixture. Of mixture, of course, yes. <laughs> OK. So what's a mixture? You just take a weighted average of several components. For example, here you have uh, two Gaussians, the black and the green. You take the average, and you get the red one. So now we had means for each of the Gaussian and the variance for each one of them. On top of it, we have the weights. And I'm going to use k to denote the total number of components. So it's used in practice because uh, if you have, if your whatever phenomena you're observing has many modes, this can be used to capture it. And in theory, we know that if you take a lot of components, you can approximate any continuous distribution. So it can be used to model subpopulations. For example, if you have heights of every guy in Berkeley, it's a Gaussian. Heights of every woman in Berkeley, it follows a Gaussian. And if you look at the overall distribution, heights of everyone in Berkeley, that follows a Gaussian mixture. So it's used a lot. And what's learning here? 
you again get samples. Now you want to estimate each wake, each mean, and each scan deviation to some accuracy. And we can ask the same question. Sample complex key, efficient algorithms. Okay. Yeah? What is the role of D here? I mean, why isn't one sample, since they're IID or the components, isn't one sample the, size? The means can be different. The mean is a vector. Okay. The mean at each calling it can be different. Yeah, it's a very valid point, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So it doesn't decompose into just like these separate estimation problems then? We'll come to it. It's a very, very good point, yeah. I think that's the, I can take away message of this talk. If you want to do something in D dimensions, you should not do it in each dimension. Well, we know that from Stein's there. Not sure. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> so, but that's a very valid point, yeah. It turns out, well, the previous uh, page, previous, sorry, previous slide was just like a back of the envelope calculation. This is an active area for the last 20 odd years. So most of the previous results, sorry, many of the previous results, uh, they consider the general covariance matrix. And uh, we'll see how it affects your sample complexity. So the work was started by the seminal work by Gaskupta, who started with uh, Gaussian mixtures when the components are far. To be succinct, like, it looks something like this. Like, you can clearly see that there are two Gaussian components. And he showed that you can cluster them into two groups, and you can study each one separately. In other words, you can learn each one individually. And there was a line of work, I'm not going to cite every, I mean, I have not cited everyone here, who reduced the separation from square root d to something of the order of log d over a course of, like, 20 odd papers. And in the most uh, recent papers by uh, uh, Greg Kalai and Ankur Moitra and another set of papers by Belkin and Sinha, they were able to study this problem without any separation. So the Gaussian mixtures, instead of looking like in the first picture, even though they look like a, uh, even though if they look like second one, they can still be able to solve it. However, they showed that you can learn it in poly, where polynomial in the number of dimensions the accuracy you want, and the minimum weight. Okay? And it's a very nice theoretical result. But they also showed a converse, which showed that if the number of components increases, all your answers scale exponentially in k. But, but the reason I'm saying it's a theoretical result is because even for k equals 2, it's a very high degree polynomial. Um, it's like, I don't think they optimize the numbers, but suffice to say, like it's like d to the 500 or something. Okay. Another line of work is by uh, Daniel Shu, Sham Kakade, and Anima, uh, who looked at spherical Gaussians. But they made a very, they parameterized the results in terms of a very clever quantity, which is like the k largest eigenvalue of like a covariance matrix. And they were able to show that you can learn it in a polynomial in D, which is the number of dimensions, k, number of components. And also, now you also it inversely depends on this eigenvalue. Okay, uh, it's difficult to exactly say what your polynomial is. I tried doing a computation. I think it's roughly like d cube or d to the four. Okay, uh, if you're an information theorist, the first question you'll ask is: Is it optimal? And uh, I can tell you, d to the five hundred probably is not the optimal answer. Um, but an even more interesting question is, are these assumptions necessary? Like, even these papers, they need some mild assumptions that the components are, need to be far apart. So are these assumptions really necessary? Like, do you need to parameterize in terms of the cake largest eigenvalue? But if you think about it for a while, you realize, like, do we really need to estimate the parameters also? Is there an even more basic problem which we are missing out? So this comes us to, like, a very philosophical question. Uh, by some US Secretary of State during World War. Uh, so his logic was, if something looks like a duck, swims like a duck, quacks like a duck, probably I'm going to think of it as a duck. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think a more appropriate answer for this duck would be, if something looks almost like a duck, swims almost like a duck, and does everything almost like a duck, then do I really care whether it's a duck or not? Okay. <laughs> So that's the philosophy. 
And this gets to the notion of learning, which you can think of it as density estimation. It's what Elias talked in the last talk. So you want to learn the mixture. You again want to learn means. You again want to learn the standard deviation and the weights. But you don't really want to give guarantees in terms of individual components. What you want to guarantee is that your output mixture should be close to the underlying one in some distance measure. And I'm using L1 because it, um, it captures the sample complex pretty well for us. And the idea is that if two mixtures look alike, but somehow the parameters are extremely different, then possibly we cannot do anything, and no one also can do something about it. And if you think about it from an application perspective, for many problems, this is enough. For example, if you want to generate new samples, all you care about is learning a mixture which looks like whatever training data you had. Or if you want to use this to like, learn a model class, use it for classification, all you want is your Gaussian mixture to be close to the underlying figure on now. Okay? So it has some applications. But I'm not saying your parameter learning is not important. Like if I ask you what's the height, like if I give you the mixture data from everyone from Berkeley, like the height of people, and I ask you what's the average height of men, you cannot say, oh, I'll tell you an answer, but I, I can only tell you up to some identifiability issue. It's not really a valid, acceptable answer. So it's really important if you want to interpret your data. But what we know and what others have shown is parameter learning can be thought of as a combination of learning the way I described plus an identifiability result, which states that if two mixtures are close, their components are close. If two mixtures are far apart, their components are far apart. Okay. And we show that if you use our algorithm, and use the identifiability results for previous papers, you get better algorithms for parameter estimation itself. Okay. So same question, what's the sample complex key? Are there efficient algorithms? Any questions about the problem setup? OK, cool. Okay. So I have only one very, very important slide. That's this one. So, <laughs> and it may change over time, but. The important thing is not to rank them. Huh? The important thing is not to rank them. It's not to rank them. OK, good to go. <laughs> OK, so just to recap, we get samples from a mixture. You want to learn the means, the variances, and the weights. You want to output something which is epsilon close to the underlying one. And there are no assumptions on this problem apart. And it's exactly the way as I stated here. OK, so the algorithms, we have one for one-dimensional algorithm, or low-dimensional. It's very cute. It's combinatorial, um, easy to explain, which I'm going to do in this talk. The other one is a high-dimensional one. Essentially, works relies on PCA, but there's a lot more techniques involved, and I'm just going to give you an outline. And that's why I'll give an outline for the motivation for our algorithm. OK, so here are our results. Uh, in terms of sample complexity, the previous results needed d to the k number of samples. To recollect, uh, k was the number of components, d was the number of dimensions. And uh, we have reduced it from d to the k to d log square d times some polynomial in k. And uh, in terms of computational complexity, our previous results needed d to the k cube. And we have reduced it to d cube plus d times some exponential in log d. Uh, one may say that all these numbers are exponential in k, but for k small values, our algorithm has a runtime of d cube, while for our previous algorithm, you get something like d to the k cube. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. yeah. What's the dependency of the sample complexity on k? Okay, I'll come to that. So it's it's a polynomial. It's k to the nine, and um, we don't know how to reduce it further. It's a very good question. Yeah. I will uh, now let me explain the one dimensional case. <coughs> so, so far, uh, let's try to see how we can extend the algorithm which we know for Gaussians to Gaussian mixtures, at least in one dimension. It turns out we tried. We tried estimating empirical mean and empirical variances. And that doesn't give you much, because imagine you have two Gaussians, which are a mixture, with two components, which are really far apart. If you estimate the mean, it will tell you zero. 
if you tell you, if you look at the variance, it will tell you probably the distance between them. But it will never give you the exact mixture which you are hoping for. And you can go for higher moments, but we couldn't prove that it's sample optimal. So I'm going to come up with a slightly roundabout way of doing the same thing. Okay, it may look very complicated when I explain it to you in terms of Gaussians, but when I move to the mixture, you'll realize why I'm doing it. Okay. Okay. The idea is you want to quantize using samples. So imagine you get a lot of samples, like say n from a mixture, from a single Gaussian. Observe that there'll be one sample which will be close to the mean and one which will be close to the mean plus standard deviation. For example, here, I'm, all I'm saying is there'll be one in this green region and one in this green region. Believable. So you take n samples. Let's say n is of the order of 1 over epsilon. And you consider this set n of xi comma xi minus xj square. Okay. At least this set, let's compute, this set has n times n minus 1 distributions. And what we know is one of the xi's will be close to the mean. One of the values of xi minus xj will be close to the standard deviation. So therefore, one of the distributions will be epsilon close to the underlying one. Really neat. And you can show that uh, if you run a, like a maximum likelihood on this set, what we can, but we don't run maximum likelihood. We run an L1 equivalent of it called Sheffe estimator. And we were able to show that if the number of samples is 1 over epsilon squared times log 1 over epsilon to this Sheffe estimator, then you obtain a Gaussian, which is epsilon close to the underlying one. Okay. Okay. So notice that the total number of samples we are using is whatever we have here plus 1 over epsilon. So the dominating term is still 1 over epsilon squared. So this goes to mixtures very directly. Um, you again take any samples from your mixture. You can see a set of all possible Gaussians, all possible weights. You can see a set of all possible mixtures where each Gaussian belongs to the set G, and all the weights belong to the set W. And similar analogy like before, the set contains a mixture, which is epsilon close to the underlying one. And you run your Sheffe estimate on this, and it has sample complexity of 1 over epsilon squared log 1 over epsilon. Okay. And the nice thing about it is this whatever approach, which looks kind of like, which doesn't do anything special, is information theoretically optimal. It works irrespective of the weights you have. And the running time. What do you mean by that? By information theoretically optimal? You can show that if you want to learn, like, for example, k equals 2, um, two component Gaussian mixtures in one dimension, you need at least 1 over epsilon square samples. So it turns out the time complexity for this algorithm, the bottleneck is the Sheffe estimator. And we show that previously it used to take the cardinality of your set F square times 1 over epsilon square. We reduced it to epsilon to the minus 2 times cardinality of F, which our problem, if you calculate, it turns out to be epsilon to the minus 7. Okay. So we have a polynomial time algorithm, which learns the underlying Gaussian mixture, information theoretically optimal, pretty simple. Yeah. Uh, it seems like this should also be reasonably robust to uh, the tail of the distribution, isn't it? Because like, what if it was a mixture, like if it was a mixture of two log concave distributions or something, and you did this, would you get something sane? Um, the point is, I'm using a fact that it's a parametric family. At least in the proofs. I'm using a fact that estimating a mean and the standard deviation is sufficient. So if you have something else, parametric, any exponential family, it will have the same property. So what about the question about using the surface estimate? No, about, uh, I think, this whole approach. You can. Okay. Any other? Okay. Um, it turns out around the same time as our work, uh, G and uh, constant in us, Gaskalakis at MIT, they were looking at the same problem. And they have an algorithm which is very similar to what I described to you right now. There are some minor differences, 
but we both use this Chaffe estimator. We both realized that you need to speed up the Chaffe and so on. Um, and recently, they have improved this exponent from 7 to 5 by using the fact that you can use the moments to reduce your search space in term in f. Okay. And as I said before, um, the result is not what surprises us. The result is the algorithm works irrespective of your weights and the variances. And yeah, that's it. OK, now let's look at uh, d-dimensional mixtures. So I'm just going to motivate my algorithm, and I'll address what Aron asked. Um, why can't we learn every dimension individually and just somehow patch them together? Okay. It turns out it doesn't work. The main reason is when you are learning every, comp every coordinate by coordinate, you want your statistic to converge very well in every coordinate. So you need a lot of samples, and therefore you easily lose some polynomial in the number of samples. Okay. But um, we still want to use the low dimensional result because that's the only tool we have learned so far. So what we do is we reduce the dimension from D to K. <coughs> Why K? Because we know that there are K means. They occupy at most a K-dimensional subspace. So we somehow project to that. And you solve it in k dimension, and you go back to d dimensions. Um, well, this is known before, like there are other algorithms which use this. Our main contribution is to show that you need to do one couple of rounds of clustering before you do your projection. And this will be what I was planning to talk in the rest of the talk. Um, and uh, just showing that these three steps work if you combine them very well. Yeah, and it gives you near optimal sample complex key. I don't think we have a very good understanding why it happens, uh, but this is like the most motivation I have for our algorithm. Um, let's speed it up a bit. Um, okay. So I said we do a low dimensional projection. The way we do it is you just compute the covariance matrix and you project it onto the top k eigenvectors of it. And uh, here is where uh, more of the uh, random matrix theory comes into play. And the reason is, it turns out S does not converge to its expected value, uh, value as fast as you want it to be in the case of a mixture. In case of a Gaussian, it converges really fast. When it's a mixture, it doesn't. Uh, the main reason is very simple. Um, okay. Let's say you look at even one dimensional case, so you don't have to worry about the actual projection. Let's say you're computing some compute, uh, quantity like mu1 plus mu2. You just want to find the average. Okay? What you do is you take this lot of samples and you hope that the actual average converges to the, uh, the empirical average converges to the actual average. It turns out the error depends on how far the Gaussians are separated. In other words, you need more samples if they are very well separated. This is kind of counterintuitive because you think that if the Gaussians are far apart, it's an easy problem. And the reason, and you're right, it's easy. The reason is you want to cluster first, and then you want to estimate within each cluster. The idea is once you cluster, the variance within each cluster would be small, and then you can apply the projection method which I described to you before. So that's our outline. Uh, we first somehow estimate the variance. I won't go into that. And then we re recursively cluster. We find the span of means. We project it onto the span of the means. And we apply our low dimension, whatever I described to you in one dimensional algorithm here. Um, as I said, we make no assumptions on weights and variances. And that's the tricky part to show that this combination works, especially the clustering one. And it's optimal. And uh, someone asked a dependence on k. So our sample complex is d k to the 9 log square d by epsilon to the 4. And the information theoretically, you can show that the best thing you can achieve is d k by epsilon square. And the best known result previously was something of the order of d to the k. So we have reduced the exponential dependence on k to something polynomial. And in terms of time, as I said, it's roughly d cube uh, from the previous d to the k cube results. So 
ir an Norge gepenge. Ja, ich gehe nur gepenge so an Gewehrienses, Mings, Hau, Farge, Inischelige, Mings, Hau, wenn ich hingehe, was gesagt. So, ganz klar, so Gewehr wie Goran, wie ich es, wie ich es clustering algorithm, to ensure, dass ihr subgewehrige Problem, in the smaller problems, where we can each problem the means are close by and the variances are well behaved. And even the weights, yeah. So last slide. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> fast, fast, fast. There's some commonality between the last section. <laughs> yeah. So, two more. This one and the next one. Okay. Uh, so there were some recent results on identifiability by um, Moritz Hark and Eric Price. Uh, guess what, like if you want to learn parameters to an accuracy epsilon parameter, then you need to pack learn to, I mean, one of the ways of scaling a result is to say that you need to pack learn to an accuracy epsilon to get six. So you just plug it into our estimator. You get, say, you get a sample complex of D by epsilon to get 24. And the previous results, they were for general covariance matrix, but they use like D to get 30. Okay. And this is, to the best of my knowledge, the best known algorithm without many assumptions. Okay, to conclude, uh, um, we looked at near optimal sample estimators for mixtures of Gaussians. Uh, we showed that a combinatorial algorithm works for one dimension and a spectral one for height. I mean, we didn't show it, but okay. Um, we have some extensions to axis aligned Gaussians, but we do not know how to solve it for general Gaussians. And more than that, the problems which I described and all the topics I covered was just for learning. You can think of other problems like clustering or regression. And only very recently people have started looking at what's the information theoretically the best way to solve these problems. So there are a lot of open problems in this area. Thanks. All right, uh, maybe one question, uh, and then the rest will add to the discussion. I can see in the actually in the mixture model why it'd be helpful to be able to do all the components because the mixing. Yeah. Common, even in the case where you didn't have mixtures, there's one Gaussian distribution. If the covariance matrix is uh, if the covariance matrix is diagonal, yes, because you are estimating um, one number of variances, which is like d parameters, and number of means, which are again d parameters. So you have totally 2D parameters. You can show that, for this case, of the order of D samples suffice. So for you as a sample? Uh, a vector. Correct, yeah. Sorry, OK. Yes, number of information you get is N times D. Number of samples times D. Uh, we can. So the number of components you get is actually like N squared then. D squared, yeah. Square. Yeah, you're right. The, the reason is you're looking at like an Euclidean. If you want each component to concentrate well, if let's say you want each component to concentrate to epsilon accuracy, you're right. One over epsilon squaring each coordinate suffice. But you want the Euclidean distance to suffice. Yeah.